In our first episode on the book of Nahum, we looked at the historical background and we looked at the archaeological setting. And now, in this episode, we want to discuss the type and the anti-type. Because uh, I think it is providential that the book of Nahum, or a fraction of it, should have been found just recently. And as the comment stated, is God trying to tell us something? So before we start, let's just open in prayer. Heavenly Father, as we open your word, may your spirit guide us in Jesus' name. Amen. So we've titled this episode, The Book of Nahum, Type Meets Antitype. And just a little reflection of where we were. This is the sign news. New Dead Sea Scroll fragments found in Israel. And they found the fragments where they had 11 lines from the book of Zechariah 8, verse 16 to 17. And they had the fraction from the book of Nahum, verses 5 to 6. We discussed this in the previous episode. But just to set the stage, let's read it again. The mountains quake because of him, and the hills melt, the earth heaves before him, the world and all that dwell therein, who can stand before his wrath? Who can resist his fury? His anger pours out like fire, and rocks are shattered because of him. So this was the final judgment, the executive judgment, and uh, these are the words with which the prophet Nahum addressed the Ninevites because they were on the receiving end of the executive judgment of God. We read in Prophets and Kings, The pride of Assyria shall be brought down, and the scepter of Egypt shall depart away, quoting Zechariah 10 verse 11. This is true not only of the nations that arrayed themselves against God in ancient times, but also of nations today who fail of fulfilling the divine purpose. In the day of final awards, when the righteous judge of all the earth shall sift the nations, according to Isaiah 30, 28, and those that have kept the truth shall be permitted to enter the city of God, heaven's arches will ring with the triumphant songs of the redeemed. You shall have song, the prophet declares, as in the night when a holy solemnity is kept and gladness of heart as when one goeth with a pipe to come into the mountain of the Lord, to the mighty one of Israel, and the Lord shall cause his glorious voice to be heard. Through the voice of the Lord shall the Assyrian be beaten down, which smote with a rod. And in every place where the grounded staff shall pass, which the Lord shall lay upon him, it shall be with tablets and harps. Now this is a clear reference to the second coming of Christ because this is when the redeemed will enter into heaven itself. And it's interesting that Assyria is mentioned here that it will be beaten down. Now Assyria doesn't exist today anymore. So obviously this is a reference to the antitype. And this is God's retributive action against a world that is in rebellion against him and his word. The great controversy has this statement, the whole universe will have become witnesses to the nature and results of sin and its utter extermination, which in the beginning would have brought fear to angels and dishonor to God, will now vindicate his love and establish his honor before a universe of beings who delight to do his will, and in whose heart is his law. Never will evil again be manifest, says the word of God. Affliction shall not rise up the second time, quoting Nahum 1 verse 9. The law of God, which Satan has reproached as the yoke of bondage, will be honored as the law of liberty. A tested and proved creation will never again be turned from allegiance to him whose character has been fully manifested before them as fathomless love and infinite wisdom. Had God intervened by destroying 
Satan and the human race when they sinned against God, then the government of God would have had this element of fear attached to it. So God didn't do this. He allowed sin to expose itself. He gave it enough rope so that eventually the entire universe would be convinced that connected with the law of God and his requirements is the happiness of all creation. And sin will not raise its head again a second time because humanity will have seen the consequences of sin and in a sense will have been inoculated against it. So when we go through the book of Nahum, we read, And the burden of Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum, the Elkishite, God's wrath against Nineveh, then we must place it into the context of our time because that is how the typology works. God is jealous and the Lord revenges. The Lord revenges and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries and he reserveth wrath. For his enemies. This has been long postponed because God's love is such that he does not want anyone to be destroyed. But eventually, when probation closes, then God's unusual act will take place a retributive action. And the prophet qualifies it by saying, The Lord is slow to anger and great in power and will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord has his way in the whirlwind and in the storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. So even though it is delayed, eventually it will take place. He is slow to anger, and he doesn't want anyone to be lost. He rebuketh the sea and makes it dry and drieth up all the rivers. Bashan languisheth and Carmel and the flower of Lebanon languisheth. The mountains quake at him and the hills melt and the earth is burnt at his presence. Yea, the world and all that dwell therein. Who can stand before his indignation? And who can abide in the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire and the rocks are thrown down by him. This is a reference to the second coming of Christ when this world will be destroyed and the righteous living and the righteous dead will be taken away to meet the Lord in the air. But here it is used in the type as a destructive warning to Nineveh. And then it's followed by this tremendous promise that we just discussed, verse 7. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knoweth them that trust him. But with the overrunning flood he will make an utter end of the place thereof, and darkness shall pursue his enemies. What do you imagine against the Lord? He will make an utter end. Affliction shall not rise up the second time. So this is a reference to the great final act of the destruction of the world and the resurrection of the just and the translation of the living just. And in this setting, there's this promise that never again will this episode of Earth's history be repeated. Affliction shall not raise up or rise up a second time. Rebellion will have been ended. And anybody with a rebellious spirit against God's government will not be a partaker of the promise to enter into his rest. Verse 10 says, For while they be folded together as thorns, and while they are drunken as drunkards, they shall be devoured as stubble, fully dry. Here again we must Look at the parallels. When we look at the book of Revelation, do we have drunkards there? Aren't there verses about being drunk with the wine of Babylon? In other words, this is referring to people who have become intoxicated with false religion. And they will be stubble. They will be destroyed. You have to 
turn away from these errors. You have to flee from the Babylonian confusion. And then this interesting verse, verse 11. And there is one come out of thee that imagineth evil against the Lord, a wicked counselor. So in the Assyrian system, there was a wicked counselor. In the end time system, there is also a wicked counselor. One who leads people astray and leads them up false paths. Thus says the Lord, Though they be quiet, and likewise many, yet thus shall they be cut down when he shall pass through. Though I have afflicted thee, I will afflict thee no more. So here is a promise to God's people that also had to suffer under these circumstances, that there will be no more affliction once he has dealt with the system that is led by an evil counselor. We must Study these types and antitypes carefully. Now there's another type in the Bible and another retributive action of God where the Assyrians were also involved. And this is Isaiah's prophecy of Sennacherib's fall. And we read it in 2 Kings 19 from verse 20. Then Isaiah, the son of Amos, sent to Hezekiah, saying, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, That which thou hast prayed to me against Sennacherib, king of Assyria, I have heard. This is the word of the Lord has spoken concerning him. The virgin, the daughter of Zion, has despised thee and laughed thee to scorn. The daughter of Jerusalem has shaken her head at thee. Whom hast thou reproached and blasphemed? And against whom hast thou exalted thy voice and lifted up thine eyes on high, even against the Holy One of Israel? So here we have another part of the puzzle. So Sennacherib the king had sent to besiege Judah. And God gives them a message of comfort. Do not be afraid of him, because who are you raising your head against? You are blaspheming the God of heaven and he will take care of you. So in the end time scenario, there is a system with, a, with an evil counselor that raises up its head against the God of Israel and blasphemes his name. And then there is a contrast. Verse 13 says, And now will I break his yoke from off thee and will burst thy bonds in sunder. And the Lord has given commandment concerning thee that no more of thy name be sown. Out of the house of thy gods will I cut off the graven image and molten image, and I will make thy grave, for thou art vile. These are very strong words against an evil system that dares to align itself against the government of God. And then you have this contrast. Behold upon the mountains the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publishes peace. O Judah, keep thy solemn feasts, perform thy vows, for the wicked shall no more pass through thee. He is utterly cast off. So you have these two contrasting systems. This great controversy between an evil system that arrays itself against God and then this group that brings good tidings of peace. Great peace have they that love thy law. So in the midst of Babylonian confusion, in the midst of this uh, apostasy and against this delusion, there is the voice of God through his people bringing the gospel of salvation to the people. And this beautiful words, Behold the mountains, the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publish peace. Now, we discussed some of the sins of the Assyrians in our previous episode. And for clarity, we'll just go there again and then bring it to the antitype and see whether we have similar conditions today. Now, it is a fact, as we have seen, that the ancient civilizations 
practice child sacrifice. And here is the University of Oxford in an article saying that the ancient Carthaginians really did sacrifice their children. Uh, some regarded this as mythological, but these were actually activities that took place on a regular basis. So this paper is published in the journal Antiquity and Dr. Josephine Quinn of Oxford University's Faculty of Classics and author of the paper said, it's becoming increasingly clear that the stories about the Carthaginian child sacrifice are true. This is something the Romans and the Greeks said the Carthaginians did and it was part of the popular history of Carthage in the 18th and 19th centuries. But in the 20th century, people increasingly took the view that this was racist propaganda on the part of the Greeks and Romans against their political enemy and that Carthage should be saved from this terrible slander. What we are saying now is that the archaeological literature and documentary evidence for child sacrifice is overwhelming and that instead of dismissing it out of hand, we should try to understand it. So these were facts. Now what's fascinating to me is that in our modern history we have a very similar circumstance. In the Reformation, everybody was absolutely clear on who the enemy was and what the enemy did. And the Reformers had no problem pointing the finger directly at Rome and saying there is the Antichrist system that arrays itself against the government of God. How much blood did they spill? How many people were murdered in the name of religion under that system? But history has been very kind in covering up those atrocities. And today this fair face of Rome is presented to the world. And Rome has again become the flower amongst the religions. But the history cannot be erased. Do we have similar child sacrifices today? Well, today we have nations that feel it is perfectly fine to legalize abortion. They also feel that it is perfectly fine in some cases to even terminate the child's life after birth. And in some religious systems, it is part of their religious system. And it's fascinating that the journal Rolling Stone uh, gave a very interesting article about how the satanic temple could bring abortion rights to the Supreme Court by using the same religious liberty arguments as Hobby Lobby. The satanic temple is trying to have its members exempted from state abortion laws. So some states are restricting abortion. And the satanic temple had a problem with this. One of the overreaching themes of the Supreme Court recent term was that it was surprisingly liberal on several major issues. Upholding gay rights, striking down an abortion restriction, and rejecting the president's request to be immune from having to turn over his financial records. All of this is true, but that doesn't make this court liberal. Rather, despite these rulings, this is still a very conservative court. And one area this has been evident is religious freedom. So the Church of Satan claimed that abortion is part of their ritual of si child sacrifice. So the exact same things as happened in Assyria and in the ancient civilizations is alive and well in a different form in societies that live today. And the general millions that are being aborted are as verily in the same category as that of the ancient civilizations. Here's another interesting article from Fox News. California proposes a curriculum with chanting the name of Aztec God who accepts human sacrifice. So this is rather interesting. So the little children are to be taught 
in the name of religious plurality to chant the names of these Aztec gods, in a sense invoke them, even though they were gods that accepted human sacrifice. One of them is Tezcalipoca, is the name of an Aztec god that was honored with human sacrifice. And according to the World History Encyclopedia, an impersonator of this god would be sacrificed with his heart removed to honor the deity. In Aztec mythology, this deity is the brother of Quetzalcoatl and other deities. And it appears that all of these will be invoked in this chant. So we seem to be going back to a system where deities that required human sacrifice are being honored, as it were, in our circles, where child sacrifice in a new form is alive and well and living in modern society. But I find it very fascinating that uh, the Corbett report gave a very sobering view of the current ethical situation in the United States of America. The Bioethics and the New Eugenics was a video that was released where they look at the ethical situation and the Biden team of ethics surrounding uh, the death issues in terms of abortion, in terms of deaths with uh, medical interventions, uh, death of people that are lying on their deathbeds, old people, deformed people. And there is a link to the ancient eugenics, the super race that Hitler aspired to. So it says here, at first glance, bioethics may seem like just another branch of ethical philosophy, where academics endlessly debate other academics about how many angels dance on the head of a pin in far-out science fiction-like scenarios. What many do not know, however, is that the seemingly benign academic study of bioethics has its roots in the dark history of eugenics. What the knowledge, the dangers inherent in entrusting some of the most important discussions about the life, death and health of humanity in the hands of a select few become even more apparent. So here are a number of people who have made it quite plain that they do not consider a newborn baby as a human being. But that maybe that human being could be, life could be terminated even within a three-month period by choice. And anybody that is born with a deformity shouldn't perhaps have the right to life and cost the state so much money. So these are some of the debates that are taking place in the world and some of the people involved at government level have opined that they have these, con these opinions contrary to what the scripture has to say. How far has humanity gone with actually dedicating themselves to Satan? Well, here's another article from Fox News. Lil Nas X spars with critics. Governor Christy Num over new song and Satan-themed sneakers. This uh, idol in America, who has made many, many videos which are, um, well, strange to say the least. We don't have to go into the details. Has recently released a song, and together with the company Nike, they have produced shoes and they will be selling 666 pairs in excess of $1,000 each pair where they actually have a red dye that has a drop of human blood in it. Now, these are very strange things that are happening. These mega companies in the world aligning themselves with satanic rituals. Is this a normal thing or is this something that God is frowning upon. So just as the ancients invoked their deities and sacrificed children and human life 
was of little value. So it seems as if these same values have snuck their way into human society today. In Matthew 24, verse 37, we read, But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. And in Genesis 6, verse 5, we read, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of the hearts was only evil continually. You know, when I look at the media today, I get a very similar feeling that crops up. But here's a very interesting statement from Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 1. But if there was one sin above another which called for the destruction of the race by the flood, it was the base crime of amalgamation of man and beast, which defaced the image of God and caused confusion everywhere. God purposed to destroy by a flood that powerful, long-lived race that had corrupted their ways before him. He would not suffer them to live out the days of their natural life, which would have been hundreds of years. It was only a few generations back when Adam had access to that tree which was to prolong life. After his disobedience, he was not suffered to eat of the tree of life and perpetuate the life of sin. In order for man to possess an endless life, he must continue to eat of the fruit of the tree of life. Deprived of that tree, his life would gradually wear out. So here we get a glimpse one of the most base crimes was the sin of amalgamation. Mixing the genetics of an animal with the genetics of a human being. Has humanity reached that point today? Here is a book, Animal Biotechnology, Academic Press, Animal Biotechnology, second edition, Models in Discovery and Translation. And here's a chapter, chapter 23, Transgenic Animals in Research and Industry. Rapidly growing technologies and genomic knowledge base have tremendously fastened the process of transgenesis. The clustered, regularly interspaced, short palindromic repeat system eases the positional integration of the gene of interest in animal models. Alteration of transgenic animals' genomes, whether to understand diseases or sufficing human needs, must be conducted under ethically restricted guidelines. Now those ethically restrictive guidelines used to be quite stringent, but they have relaxed as humanity has come to regard life with uh, less awe than they had in the past. We have been desensitized by what we see on our television screens every day that is dished up to us by Jesuit theater. It is incredible how the mindset of man has changed over time. Here is uh, NBC News. China has done human testing to create biologically enhanced super soldiers, says a top U.S. official. They're using technology and they're using genetic alterations in order to enhance and maybe to bring about a situation where certain animal propensities are incorporated in humanity to produce Super soldiers. Washington U.S. intelligence shows that China has conducted human testing on members of the People's Liberation Army in hope of developing soldiers with biologically enhanced capabilities, the top U.S. intelligence official said Friday. John Ratcliffe, the director of national intelligence, included the explosive claim in a long Wall Street Journal op-ed in which he made the case that China poses the preeminent national security threat to the U.S. Now much of this research is top secret. And what we find in the journals today is what is taking place in the labs out there. What is happening at the military level 
in secret labs, no one knows. There is an article from WW Defense One, and it states that the US military is genetically engineering new life forms to detect enemy subs. So they are incorporating the genes of animals that have, for exam example, sonar ability, like dolphins, into other creatures and uh, enhancing their capabilities in that way. National Geographic reported that there have been human-pig hybrids created in the lab. In a remarkable, if likely controversial feat, scientists announced that they have created the first successful human-animal hybrid. The project proves that human cells can be introduced into non-human organisms, survive and even grow inside a host animal, in this case pigs. This biomedical advance has long been a dream and a quandary for scientists hoping to address a critical shortage of donor organs. Now that is one aspect. Now these are referring to animal-human transgenic experiments. There have of course been many, many experiments with crop plants and geoengineering in crops and GMO foods and GMO forests and GMO, GMO animals where you had super pigs. And uh, the trouble with these pigs in the past was that they were very, very diseased because you cannot mess with God's perfect plan. It is because of evolutionary ideas that humanity thinks they can improve upon the blueprint. But every experiment tells us that all that they attain is actually a deterioration. I gave lectures in the past on genetically modified pigs, for example, where they transferred the gene for human growth hormone into pigs. And the pigs, together with their normal growth hormones, grew much faster, leaner, but they were deformed. Their bone structure was deformed. Their facial structures were deformed. But they had more meat and leaner meat. And this was considered perfectly fine. But here now, you're having direct mingling of humanity with animals. Now, how far has this gone? Here's an article from 2019. And it was in Scientific America. Japan approves first human-animal embryo experiments. A Japanese stem cell scientist is the first to receive government support to create animal embryos that contain human cells and transplant them into surrogate animals since a ban on the practice was overturned earlier this year. So since 2019, governments have given permission for this kind of experimentation. The leader of the team of the University of Tokyo, together with Stanford University in California, plans to grow human cells in mouse and rat embryos and then transplant those embryos into surrogate animals. The ultimate goal is to produce animals with organs made of human cells that can eventually be transplanted into people. Now people think that uh, you know these are noble causes. But humanity being what it is, and humanity having a fallen nature, and the ethical guidelines deteriorating over time, tell us that this can lead to many other things, probably already has, in secret experiments. There are many, many uh, cases where they refer to experiments in East Bloc countries, Russia, for example, where such experimentation has been going on for quite some time. So the parallels that we had in the antediluvian world and the parallels that we had in the ancient civilizations seem to be raising their heads in the times that we are living in. If we go to chapter 2 in the book of Nahum, where it refers to the destruction of Nineveh, there are some interesting verses. We're not going to go into the structure of the book because we did that in the first episode. 
In Nahum chapter 2 verse 1 we read, He that dasheth in pieces is come up before thy face. Keep the munition, watch the way, make thy loins strong, fortify thy power mightily. For the Lord has turned away the excellency of Jacob as the excellency of Israel, for the emptiers have emptied them out and marred their vine branches. That's a fascinating verse. Here is an allusion to the fact that the religion of Nineveh had an impact on the religion of Israel. And what did they do to the religion of Israel? Well, the excellency of Jacob has been emptied out. And this vine that represents the truth has become marred. We must be very, very careful that the religions of the world do not so influence God's people at the end of time that we develop a syncretistic religion with elements of Babylonian religion integrated into our very midst or any liaison with those religions which unfortunately is something that humanity is inclined to do for the so-called common good. The shield of his mighty men is made red, the valiant men are in scarlet, the chariots shall be with flaming torches in the day of his preparation, and the fir trees shall be terribly shaken. Now a tree in the scripture refers to humanity. So here is coming a terrible calamity upon those that not only practiced the atrocities of those days, but dared to try and influence the religion of God's people. The chariot shall rage in the streets. They shall jostle one against another in the broad ways. They shall seem like torches. They shall run like the lightnings. He shall recount his worthies. They shall stumble in their walk. They shall make haste to the wall thereof and the defense shall be prepared. This is a reference to the king of Assyria who's trying to avert this calamity and his soldiers are being told to uh, defend the city but it will lead to nothing. There are some that claim that these verses have a futuristic uh, tone uh, referring to the end of time when vehicles would be uh, like they are today with great speed. But in the context here, it refers to the time of the Assyrian destruction of Nineveh. So we read in the Spirit of Prophecy, there will soon be a sudden change in God's dealings. The world in its perversities is being visited with casualties by floods, storms, fires, earthquakes, famines, wars, and bloodshed. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power, yet he will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord has his way in the whirlwind and in the storm and in the clouds of the dust of his feet, quoting Nahum 1 verse 3. Oh, that men might understand the patience and long-suffering of God. He is putting under restraint his own attributes. His omnipotent power is under the control of omnipotence. Oh, that men would understand that God refuses to be wearied out with the world's perversity and still holds out the hope of forgiveness even to the most undeserving. But his forbearance will not always continue. Who is prepared for the sudden change that will take place in God's dealings with sinful men? Who will be prepared to escape the punishment that will certainly fall upon the transgressors? Here's a warning that the very things that led to the destruction of the ancient world, the antediluvian world, and these ancient civilizations are alive and well in the time that we are living in. Proverbs 28 verse 13 says, He that covereth his sin shall not prosper, but whosoever confesses and forsakes them shall have mercy. God cannot be mocked, but he still holds out his hand and wants people to repent and come to him. And the door of probation is not yet closed. It's still possible. 
No repentance is genuine that does not work reformation. The righteousness of Christ is not a cloak to cover unconfessed and unforsaken sin. It is a principle of life that transforms the character and controls the conduct. Holiness is wholeness for God. It is the entire surrender of heart and life to the indwelling of the principles of heaven. We can go along with the flow in the world that we are living in and we can consider uh, that the activities can be excused in their modern form. But God cannot be mocked. There is still time to realize that that which is happening in the world is not necessarily something that we should emulate. Perhaps the world is becoming as gross as it is so that even the most liberally minded can see that there's something wrong and hopefully will turn, turn from their ways and their thinking and turn to a better way, the narrow path in the Bible. Now, Nahum chapter 2 gets interesting at this point. In verse 6 we read that the gates of the rivers shall be opened and the palace shall be dissolved. Now there are some that believe that uh, as in the case of the fall of Babylon, there was also a stemming of the water of the Tigris River so that the, the enemy armies could come in or the Babylonian coalition could come in and destroy Nineveh. But verse 7 is interesting, and it says, And Husap shall be led away captive. She shall be brought up, and her maids shall lead her as with the voice of doves, tabering upon their breasts. But Nineveh is of old like a pool of water, yet they shall flee away. Stand, stand, shall they cry, but none shall look back. Now, there's much discussion about this verse. And uh, this word, husap, is causing great controversy. This is how the King James translates uh, the original. And husap shall be led away captive. Now it's written in the female gender. She shall be brought up. Now the modern translations render it this way. The NIV says, it is decreed that Nineveh be exiled and carried away. So they equate Husap with Nineveh. But the King James translators directly translated the original as Husap, feminine, shall be led away captive and she shall be brought up and her maid shall lead her as with the voice of dove, tabbering upon their breasts. That is, beating upon their breasts. Now here's a, a Bible commentary from Kaufman's commentary on the Bible. And it reads as follows. And it is decreed, she is uncovered, she is carried away, and the handmaids moan as with the voice of doves, beating upon their breast. The text in a number of places here is not certain, and scholars are much perplexed as to the identity of the feminine person uncovered or stripped and carried away to the accompaniment of weeping handmaidens. Some see it as a personification of Nineveh, as we saw in the NIV Bible, the New English Bible makes it to be the queen, in other words, the literal queen of Assyria. And others see it as a reference to the patron goddess of Assyria, Ishtar, humbled and bemoaned by her regiments of sacred prostitutes. So these are some of the interpretations in the world out there. And the King James opted for Husap shall be led away captive in the feminine form. So who is this female component that the King James here is referring to? They conclude here with their statement, there is really no good reason to suppose that any such disasters did not occur. 
The ruin of Nineveh was complete. Let the details be filled in any way one chooses. I don't think one should do it any way one chooses. One should make a careful study. And I'm of the opinion that God used those Protestant reformers through the Holy Spirit to render it as it is in the King James Version. J.M.P. Smith has this interesting comment. He says, The probability that the goddess of Nineveh is referred to here is certainly greater than that it is the queen. The latter played no conspicuous part in Assyrian history, but the goddess occupied a very large part in the minds of Assyrian monarchs. It is the goddess. The maidens are probably the female devotees of Ishtar, the sacred prostitutes. So if we go with the goddess idea, this goddess Ishtar was also the goddess of war. And she was the one that was invoked in battle, even in her pre-Ishtar form, which comes from Babylon. Now, do we have any parallels with this kind of ideology and theology today? Well, here is the goddess Ishtar, and the goddess Ishtar is always associated with her star. And her star, as you can see, is an eight-pointed star. So there are eight points to the star. She's also associated with lions and she is associated with owls. Here she has the feet of an owl. And today this owl is also being worshipped, for example, in Bohemian Grove ceremonies where the top politicians of the world partake in these ceremonies where this bohemian owl, which is a symbol of Moloch, is uh, brought to the fore. So do we have similar things in the world today? If we continue with chapter 2, it says, Take ye the spoil of silver, take the spoil of gold, and there is none end of the store and glory out of all the pleasant furniture. She is empty and void and waste, and the heart melteth and the knees smite together, and much pain is in all loins, and the faces of them all gather blackness. Where is the dwelling of the lions, and the feeding place of the young lions, where the lion, even the old lion, walked, and the lions whelp, and none made them afraid? So here was a power that relied on its might and its pomp, and it felt secure. But it was not secure. The lion did tear in pieces enough for its wealth and strangled for his lioness and filled his holes with prey and his dens with raven. This power felt nothing to destroy the nations around them and rip them to pieces. But its time had come. Behold, I am against thee, says the Lord of hosts, and I will burn her chariots in the smoke and the sword shall devour thy young lions, and I will cut off thy prey from the earth, and the voice of thy messenger shall no more be heard. This power of old was destroyed. And in like fashion, the antitype today will also be destroyed. Woe to Nineveh, chapter 3. Woe to the bloody city. It is all full of lies and robbery. The prey departeth not. This power had captured the nations around, even Israel, had infused them with their rituals, with their religion, with their hierarchy, had subjected them to its rule. And this system was to come to an end. Is there a power today that does exactly the same thing, that infuses the religious systems of the world with its ideology, that rules amongst the nations, that is in the echelons of power and dictatorship,
dictates to princes and prelates and presidents what they should do. The noise of a whip and the noise of the rattling of the wheels and of the prancing horses and of the jumping chariots. The horseman lifteth up both the bright sword and the glittering spear and there's a multitude of slain and a great number of carcasses and there is none end of their corpses. They stumble upon their corpses. This system will suffer under God's retributive action. Because of the multitude, and here's the reason, because of the multitude of the whoredoms of the well-favored harlot, the mistress of witchcraft that selleth nations through her whoredoms and families through her witchcraft, this typology is incredibly powerful. So here is a system that leads to apostasy towards God, which in biblical terms is called whoredom. And she is the well-favored harlot. Is there such a well-favored harlot that is the darling of the kings of this world and of the religious systems of this world? who is a mistress of witchcraft and sells nations through her whoredom. Now what is this witchcraft? It is pharmacia. Pharmacia. And families through her witchcraft. Behold, I am against thee, says the Lord of hosts, and I will discover thy skirts upon thy face. I will show your nakedness. I will expose your witchcraft. I will show the nations who you really are. And I will show the nations thy nakedness and the kingdoms thy shame. This is a promise. And what happened to Assyria will happen at the end of time. So let's go back to ancient times and just have a look at this typology. I've dealt with it in previous lectures, but for the sake of completeness, let's just go back to that ancient religion. The ancients believed that the god of Marduk, who was the favorite of Babylon, and in these ancient religions, he was the one that ruled over the children of evil. So Marduk had a sign, and that sign was the sign of Anu. And he had the sword, and he had the trident. Question. We need the trident, we need the sword, and we need the sign of Anu, which is the eight-pointed star, which is basically two crosses over each other. And this power claims to have authority over fallen humanity, all of it. So the enemy, fallen humanity, is kept in check by the god Marduk, who receives his power from the supreme deity Anu. Now, do we have a system like that in the world today? Do we have a system that claims to wield the sword, the spiritual sword, over the secular sword? Do we have a system that in its symbology uses the trident? And the answer is yes. And do we have a system that claims to have the symbol or the sign of Anu and that claims to be the ruler of humanity. Here again you have the sign of Anu which is also the star of Ishtar and in this case over here it's depicted in this fashion where you have a straight bar and a curved ray and together they make eight. Now the curved is the female and the straight is the masculine. In other words, this was an androgenic system, a fusion, an hermaphrodite, if you like, just like the god Baphomet, the goat with the horns, with the female breasts, and the rest of the anatomy is masculine. So you have this mingling of the genders. Do we have something like that happening in the world today? Is this gender line of demarcation becoming confused in the world today. If you look at the ancient religions, 
they were replete with sexual atrocities that were unbelievable. There were all kinds of rituals ranging from incest to bestiality, just as we have in the world today. And what happens in some of the secret societies of the world, no one needs to say in public. Well, here is the largest sign and symbol of Anu that exists in the world today, and it is in the court of the Vatican. So here you have the eight-pointed star with the obelisk in the center, which again refers to the sexual connotation, the generative power of this religion. And this is a bold claim that this power, which is residing in Rome, has the power to rule over the children of fallen humanity. This is the symbol of Marduk given to him by Anu. Now if you go to the ancient deities, the god Dagon, or Dagan, as it is sometimes written. Here's an article in the Encyclopedia Britannica. They refer to him as a creature of part man and part fish, and that this fish god Dagon was an object of reverent worship in early Babylon and Assyria is clear from the monuments. Now the same headgear has just been modified to some extent. The pail with the holy water is held in the hand, and uh, the same headgear is worn today by the papal system. Nothing has changed. We have just given the deities different names, and we depict them in different ways. But this is the same ancient religion that existed in days of old. In Matthew 23, verse 9, we read, and call no man your father upon the earth. For one is your father which is in heaven. Neither be you called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. If you go into the Roman Catholic system, the priest, what are they called? They are called father. And what is the Pope called? He's called holy father, which is a blasphemy, which is directly against the Word of God. But there's another organization that refers to themselves as masters, even worshipful masters. Revelation chapter 22 verse 8 tells the story where John the Revelator falls at the feet of the angel to worship him, the one who brings him the revelation. And I, John, saw these things and I heard them and when I heard and seen I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me these things. And then says he unto me, See that thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren of the prophets and of them which keep the sayings of this book, worship God. It is forbidden in the Bible to call someone in a religious context your father, it is forbidden in a religious context to call someone your master and to worship them. And John, when he was overawed, fell at the feast of the angel and the angel said, angel said, don't do it. I am just a fellow servant. Worship God. Now if that applies to an angel, how much more so to a fallen human being? Now let's go back to that ancient time and find another clue which links the Assyrian Empire to the time in which we are living. And we find it here on the Shalmaneser Stella. Here's the black obelisk of Shalmaneser III, 19th century BC, from Nimrud in the modern-day Nineveh, Governorate, Iraq, the British Museum, London. And here they have an interesting relief where Yehu, from Israel, bows before Shalmaneser III. This is the only portrayal we have in ancient Near Eastern art of an Israelite or a Judean monarch. And here you see Jehu 
bowing down to Shalmaneser III. Now, there's something interesting about him. Again, you have the sign over there of Anu, and you have the symbol of the god Shamash over there, and you have the king with his headgear, reminiscent of what we saw in the papal system. And you have this individual, who is the king, as it were, of Israel, bowing down to Shalmaneser. And he has this strange headgear, this hat with the little loping top. Now, what is that hat, and where do we find it today? And why is he subservient to this power? He is subservient, and yet he is a free man. That means he may rule according to his discretion, subject to obedience to the higher power, which happens to be the king of Assyria. Later on, this position was taken over by the king of Babylon. And today, the Bible tells us we have a Babylon that we must flee from that also has such a king that everybody must bow down to and they may rule as freemen subject to this obedience. And they had this little cap which gave them liberty. Let's look at it. It is the Phrygian cap, once worn in ancient Rome by emancipated slaves as a mark of their freedom and adopted in the revolution as the cap of liberty. So this is what makes you a free man. In other words, Freemasons are associated with this cap and it's red in color. Now here's a little bit of uh, information about it from GnosticWarrior.com. From the Phrygian to Liberty Cap. In late Republican Rome, a soft felt cap called the Pileus served as a symbol of free men, that is non-slaves, and was symbolically given to slaves upon manumission, in other words freedom thereby granting them not only their personal liberty, but also libertas, freedom as citizens, with the right to vote if they were a male. Following the assassination of Julius Caesar in 44 BC, Brutus and his co-conspirators instrumentalized the symbolism of the Pileus to signify the end of Caesar's dictatorship and return to the Roman Republican system. These Roman associations of the Pileus were with liberty and republicanism were carried forward to the 18th century when the Pileus was confused with the Phrygian cap, with the Phrygian cap then becoming a symbol of those values. So basically, it was born by revolutionaries that freed themselves from tyranny. Now there's a religious connotation. Because in the religious connotation, there is also a ruler who has a set of rules. And that ruler is the king of heaven. And he has a set of rules which is called the Ten Commandments. And this system that wants to free itself from it is a system that says, do what thou wilt is the whole of the law. And in the occult world, that is where they strive for, where they have a freedom from the tyranny of God's law. Now let's see where this leads to. Under the French Revolution, the philosophers like Voltaire, they were of course Jesuits, uh, introduced the original Declaration of Human Rights and they depicted it on two tables, like the two tables of stone. In other words, it was a rebellion against God's law. And I've given lectures on this before, and I'm not going to repeat them here. But basically, the Charter of Human Rights negates every single one of God's law. I gave a lecture, they've made voice, void thy law once, where I show that in general, 
the Human Rights Charter violates the law of God. So it's so interesting that in between they have the fasciae, this bundle of rods, and the Jesuits have claimed that fascism is their form of uh, governance that they prefer. And then at the top here, we'll have to increase it in size to see what uh, the power is from which these laws emanate. Here is the top. You can see the serpent with his tail in the mouth. In other words, depicting eternal life through the life-giving serpent, not Christ, who is the source of all life. And then there is the all-seeing eye in the triangle. And if you've ever been to Jesuit cathedrals, you will find this symbol in all of them. This is one of the symbols that is very prominent in Jesuitical thinking. And of course, it's also on the dollar sign. So here is the Phrygian cap, which was worn by the revolutionists during the Masonic French Revolution in the 18th century. And it symbolized this liberty, this freedom, and in essence, the freedom from God's law. Now, it doesn't take a rocket scientist in the times that we are living in to see that humanity is legislating all over the world against God's law. There is a slippery slide. And the legislations that are coming out in the world are so contrary to God's word that it is astounding. And it seems as if the religious world has become paralyzed and incapable of even lifting their voice to the whimper stage to protest against these activities. But Mike, make no mistake, God cannot be mocked. Let's look at this system. So you had the Ten Commandments, you had the Phrygian cap, you had this life-giving serpent, and you had the supreme architect of the universe, which is a symbol of Lucifer, because he's the one who wants to negate God's law. And here you see the Phrygian cap, which becomes the symbol of that liberty. Now, another interesting connection between the French Revolution and this Phrygian cap is the United States of America. And here's the Scottish Rite Journal, and it talks about the Masonic legacy of Lady Liberty. And this is what they write. The Statue of Liberty is an American landmark visited by approximately 3.5 million people every year and is recognized internationally as a symbol of American ideals. But what is the story behind Lady Liberty and her Masonic legacy? Now remember, this is the Scottish Rite Journal writing. It's out of the horse's mouth. Many of us had learned an abbreviated tale of the 305 feet tall copper statue in primary school. France had gifted the Statue of Liberty to the United States as a gift to commemorate their successful alliance against American Revolution and the larger-than-life figure was placed by Ellis Island in New York to welcome newcomers to the land of freedom. What they failed to teach in school, however, is the Statue of Liberty's Masonic origin and ties to Freemasonry. In fact, the Colossus in New York's harbor was conceived, financed, built, and installed by Freemasons. The capstone is, the cornerstone is Masonic. Of course, there's nothing new about her. She is the same as the goddess Libat, Libertas of Rome. Here you can see a statue of the goddess Libertas, also with the seven uh, rays around her crown. By the way, the seven rays were also a symbol of the god Mitra, the sun god. And the flame that she holds is the flame of Lucifer. 
Now, when you look at the Statue of Liberty, there's some other, one other thing that's interesting. It's a statue of a lady, the goddess Libertas, but it is also the statue, as it were, of the god Mitra. And if you look at the face, it is a very masculine face. So again, you have the, this androgenic, this mixing of gender within the statue itself. In Revelation chapter 13, we read of two beasts. The first beast was this beast that arose out of the sea, and the reformers were absolutely clear on it that this was the Roman Catholic system. But there was also a second beast that came up out of the earth and had two horns like a lamb, and it spoke as a dragon. In other words, here was a system that had lamb-like attributes. In other words, it appeared to be a Protestant Christian nation, but it spoke as a dragon. And the dragon is the one that gave the first beast, Roman Catholicism, its power. And we are told that the dragon was Rome, and in its greater sense, the devil. We read that in Revelation chapter 12. And in verse 12, we read that the second power exercises all the power of the first beast before him. So the same authority that was wielded by the Roman Catholic system in the Middle Ages over the nations, that same power is wielded by the second power, the United States of America, and causes the earth and them that dwell therein to worship the first beast. In other words, to introduce a system of worship which is unique to the Roman Catholic system, whose deadly wound was healed because Rome had received a deadly wound in 1798 when a secular power was removed, but that was given back to it in 1929 by Mussolini and since has blossomed that every nation is subject to her. When we just look at the United States and we see all the Jesuits and Knights of Malta and Knights of Columbus in positions of power within that government, there can be no doubt as to who controls that system. In fact, Archbishop Quigley in 1903 in the Chicago Tribune already had opined that when the United States rules the world, the Catholic Church will rule the world. We are at the very point in history where the Assyrians were. Let's go a little further. Here is the god Mitra, and you can see that he has this cap of liberty on his head, and he is feeding the eagle. Now, the eagle is also a symbol of the United States of America. So the red cap of liberty is also known as the Phrygian cap or Mithraic cap, sacrificial cap, mitre, and in French, as the bonnet de la liberté, or bonnet rouge. It's because it was red. It symbolizes the sacred acts of initiation. Now listen carefully. The sacred acts of initiation, sacrifice, liberty, revolution, enlightenment, and brotherhood. And these rituals all take place within Masonic fraternities, and they eventually lead to this brotherhood to which the papacy has just recently referred in its brotherhood encyclical. So if we go to the seal and the emblem of the United States Department of the Army, then you will see that there you have the little Phrygian cap. And if you go to the United States of America War Office, you will see there again the Phrygian cap and the serpent entwined above it in both cases. That's very fascinating. So the same symbol that was worn by Jehu when he was subservient and had his liberty on condition of service to the king of Assyria so anyone who wears this cap wears it on condition of subservience to the king of Babylon, in other words, the papacy in Rome. 
The United States Senate, and that's the highest governing body in the United States of America, also has this Phrygian cap. In other words, they are freemen subject to Rome. They can only be free in the context of serving the common good as defined by Rome. Even the religious systems of the world can have religious freedom provided it is subject to the common good as prescribed by Rome. Let's go a little bit further. If you go to the Capitol and you look at the dome, there are numerous uh, excellent paintings up there. And the red liberty cap and its association with the President of the United States base dates back to our first Freemasonic President, George Washington, who we can see immortalized in the U.S. Capitol building, Rotunda, seated with a sword next to Lady Liberty. So here is Washington, and there is Lady Liberty, and she has the red Phrygian cap. She also has the fasciae in her hand, which is the symbol of government where the government and the industry work together for the sake of the common good. If we go a little bit further, we find that the red liberty cap was also an integral part of American culture and symbology in the 19th century and is seen in many places in the United States Capitol. The red cap of liberty appears on a headgear of the goddess Columbia, and here we can see that with a red cap on her head, who in turn was visualized as a goddess-like female, national personification of the United States and of liberty herself. Can we see the connection with the goddess? So was the King James rendering of that verse where it referred to the goddess correct? Here we also have a goddess. Now, this goddess has many names, as we have seen. If we go to the District of Columbia, which, by the way, is an independent state within the United States of America, where the governing body sits, then Lady Justice, hanging a wreath on the statue of George Washington, the motto of the District of Columbia is Justitia Omnibus, Latin for Justice for All. And in 1871, the year in which the district was organized in its present form, in the background is the United States Capitol building. And on the right and on the left, a train steams across the viaduct under a rising sun. So here you have the District of Columbia, which is a goddess. But the whole area is called Maryland. Maryland. Isn't that interesting? So here we have the entire connotation of this deity which is Mary deified because Pope John Paul II said that he is not averse to the idea that Mary should be part of the Godhood. So here you have the goddess connotation and through this connotation worldly leaders and religious leaders are being led astray. Nahum 3 verse 6, And I will cast abominable filth upon thee, and make thee vile, and will set thee as a gazing stock. And it shall come to pass that all they that look upon thee shall flee from thee, and say, Nineveh is laid waste, and will bemoan her. When shall I seek comforters for thee? So, do we have similar verses in the New Testament? Doesn't it say, flee from Babylon? Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins and receive not of her plagues? Art thou better than populous? No. That was situated among the rivers that had the waters round about it, whose rampart was the sea and a wall was from the sea? We refer to this in our first episode. This was the area that today would be typified by the Luxor in, in Egypt that was destroyed by the Assyrians. And now what happened to them and their gods will happen to the Assyrians and their gods 
and will happen to the anti-type in our day with their gods. Ethiopia and Egypt were her strength, and it was infinite. Put and Lubim were her, thy helpers. Yet was she carried away. She went into captivity. Her young children were dashed in pieces at the top of the streets. They cast lots for her honorable men, and all her great men were bound in chains. Assyria had vanquished this ancient populous city of No, the modern Luxor with her deities. In the same way, she had taken the northern tribes of Israel captive and scattered them amongst the nations. In the same way, modern Assyria, the antitype, has captured people and dashed their children's heads against the stones. If you think of the Valdenses, if you think of the Albigenses, if you think of the ancient Sabbath-keeping people in the world that were vanquished by Rome, the same will happen to her. Thou also shalt be drunken, thou shalt be hid, and also shalt seek strength because of the enemy. In the same way, they will be drunk, but not with drunk of false doctrine, they will be drunk with the blood that they have spilt. Here's a video of what took place at a Masonic gathering in England in 2017, at the end of 2017. And uh, it's interesting to see what they are saying. Now we've shortened it, it's just a short clip, but uh, here you can see some of the symbolism, the all-seeing eye of course, the compass and set square. Let's have a look at this and then have a brief discussion. Self-evident, Brother Franklin, all men are created equal. Indeed, Brother Washington, all Freemasons meet as equals, and we have an opportunity to create a nation in the very essence of Masonic morality. It would be wonderfully symbolic, don't you think? You'll be wanting to put the all-seeing eye on our banknotes next. Hmm. Uh, you are... Uh, you think I'm taking it a bit far? Please don't ask me questions like that, Brother Franklin. You know I cannot tell a lie. Oh, oh, come on, Brother Washington. Everybody lies occasionally, surely. Especially politicians. Not me. Not even so much as an alternative fact. Oh, but we must all be aware of fake news. <laughs> as permanent master of these three lodges, I now call on my deputy masters. Most worshipful Grand Master, on behalf of the brethren of Royal Somerset House, most worshipful Grand Master, I humbly ask you to complete the initiation of this worthy candidate for Freemasonry. I had the pleasure of meeting 136 Grand Masters visiting from overseas at Freemasons Hall yesterday. Today, though, we are a meeting of more than 4,000 gathered from all around the world, from our own constitution and beyond. When the global Masonic family comes together to celebrate our past and to renew our own pride and confidence in and enthusiasm for Freemasonry. Now, when we look at that little extract from that YouTube video, we will notice a few interesting things. They showed Franklin and Washington in the beginning making no bones about the fact that their nation had Masonic origins. And also about the political systems and the morality of Masonry. We saw that the Grand Master, the Duke of Kent, who is the cousin of Queen Elizabeth, was called Most Worshipful Grand Master, and you bowed down to him. Now, these are things that the Bible strictly forbids, and yet it takes part in this system. 
They have the all-seeing eye, they have the compass and the set square, and they have the letter G, which they say stands for God, but in actual fact stands for the generative power. In other words, this prostitutional sexual power, this androgenic power, as you were, or this transgender power that exists in the world and that is being propagated in the world today. The God that they worship is not the God of heaven, even though the Christian lodges will have a Bible on their altars. Other lodges will have their religious books on the altar, and the 33-degree lodge in Washington has all the religious books on their altar. Who is the true God of masonry? I've given many lectures on this, and I'm not going to go into details. I'll just quote two sources. Albert Pike's Moral and Dogma, which, by the way, is the highest, one of the highest sources in Freemasonry. And when I was in that place myself, as a, as a tourist, I was standing on the place where Albert Pike was supposedly buried, and I was reprimanded for standing on holy ground because this man is so revered in Masonry. He wrote, strange and mysterious name to give to the spirit of darkness. Lucifer, the son of the morning, is it he who bears the light and with its splendor intolerable, blinds, feeble, sensual or selfish souls? Doubt it not. The God of Freemasonry is Lucifer. I was standing at the sick bed of a grand master in Africa and had a few hours discussion with him because he was fervently of the opinion that Lucifer was the true son of God. Here is a article in a Stockholm University magazine. This is the history of religion, Stockholm University, Sweden. And this is a scholarly article about the writings of Blavatsky. And I'm just going to read a short piece of the abstract in this journal, and it says, Blavatsky's influential The Secret Doctrine of 1888, one of the foundation texts of theosophy, contains chapters propagating an unembarrassed Satanism. Theosophical sympathy for the devil also extended to the name of their journal Lucifer and discussions conducted in it. To Blavatsky, Satan is a cultural hero akin to Prometheus, according to her reinterpretation of the Christian myth of the fall in Genesis 3. Satan, in the shape of the serpent, brings Gnosis and liberates mankind. There is a reversal of theology. The present article situates these ideas in a wider 19th century context, where some poets and socialist thinkers held similar ideas, and a counter-hegemonic reading of the fall had far-reaching feminist implications. Additionally, influences on Blavatsky from French occultism and research on Gnosticism are discussed, and the instrumental values of satanic shock tactics is considered. The article concludes that esoteric ideas cannot be viewed in isolation from politics and the world at large. Rather, they should be analyzed both as part of a religious cosmology and as having strategic, polemical and didactic functions related to political debates, or at the very least carrying potential entailments for the latter. If we consider that the United Nations sub-organizations are run by the ideology of theosophy and that Masonic lodges are run on a similar basis, we can see that the world is in a very similar situation to what we had in ancient Assyria and in the pre-flood world. Here on the right we have the Duke of Kent in his regalia as the worshipful master, the head of Freemasonry in the world. 
And this was his father who died at a very early age. And you can see some of the, the regalia that he wears. Here, for example, is the Maltese cross of the Order of Malta. Now, it's interesting that they say that this is the Protestant version. There's no such thing. The Order of Malta is a Roman Catholic order. And to call this a Protestant arm is nothing else than a front. Here is the Duke of Kent, Prince Edward, with his similar regalia. And we see this throughout the royal family. Here's the Queen of England. There is the Duke of Kent. He's her first cousin. He's the head of masonry. Here he is also. And you will notice that he has this eight-pointed star on his chest. Now, these symbols that he is wearing and that the others were wearing, and in fact, here you have the entire royal family, you can see that they all are wearing this. The one that the Duke of Kent is wearing is obscured, but you could see it in the previous one. Uh, this, of course, is the Order of the Garter, and this is reserved for the royal family and sometimes after their retirement for uh, heads of state. It's interesting that Winston Churchill was offered the privilege of being part of the Order of the Garter, but having lost the election, he said, if they gave me the boot, why should I be honored with this great honor? So sometimes presidents or prime ministers can be initiated into this, but basically it's for the royal family. And it has the eight-pointed star, as we can see here in his military dress, he is wearing it. So the Duke at Kent, 80 years old, the life of the Queen's cousin. And whenever the Queens and the kings of the world visit the papacy, initially they wear black. It's only under the latest popes that some of these rules have been relaxed. This is an order of respect. It shows that you are below this great power at the Vatican. These are the secret orders by which Rome runs the world through its secret fraternities. Here's an interesting article from the Jesuits in Britain. So this is directly out of the horse's mouth, Jesuit.org. And it's referring to a ceremony where the son of the Duke of Kent, who has to be a Protestant in order to be in line for the throne, has a son and a wife who converted to Catholicism. That's making a display of the fact that actually they are Catholics masquerading as Protestants. Here at Theodore House, the Christian Heritage Center at Stonyhurst College was officially opened by Lord Nicholas Windsor. On Friday, the four million pound project converted a listed disused mill in the college ground into a center for study, retreats, Christian renewal, and for the training of the laity in Christian leadership. Lord Nicholas, youngest son of the Duke and Duchess of Kent, and a convert to Catholicism, whereby, of course, he gave up his right to the throne, is a royal patron of Theodore House. He unveiled a plaque on the site of the converted corn mill in the presence of Lord Shuttleworth, the Lord Lieutenant of Lancashire, and more than 200 dignitaries. The opening ceremony also involved a blessing by the Right Reverend John Arnold, the Catholic Bishop of Salford, and the Right Reverend Julian Henderson, the Anglican Bishop of Blackburn. Lord Nicholas Windsor said, It is a very exciting moment. Theodore House will be a center of excellence in the field of formation, study, and retreats. And of course, it will be known for the new evangelization. Now, what does that mean? Well, formation, what is that? That's spiritual formation, which is the exercises of Loyola, Jesuit teaching that directly contradicts the scripture, where a form and a ritual takes the place of faith in the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And the new evangelization, it's the new world religion with its Catholic overtones. 
These people are papal knights working for Rome. Nahum chapter 3 verse 12. All thy strongholds shall be like fig trees with the first ripe figs, if they be shaken, and shall even fall into the mouth of the eater. Behold, thy people in the midst of thee are women. The gates of thy land shall be set wide open unto thine enemies. The fire shall devour thy bars. And if you look at this symbolism and you bring it into today's world, then Rome surely is surrounded by women. A woman is a symbol of the church. And in the ecumenical movement, people are aligned with this system. It is a system of women that will bring their power to bear on the states to introduce legislation that will honor the first beast of Revelation chapter 13, the papacy. It is the great controversy between Christ and Satan. It is Christ and his salvation and his law pitted against a salvation by works contrary to God's law. Draw thee waters for the siege, fortify thy strongholds, go into clay and tread the mortar, make strong the brick kiln. There shall the fire devour thee, the sword shall cut thee off, it shall eat thee up like the canker worm. Make thyself many as the canker worm, make thyself many as the locust. Thou hast multiplied thy merchants above the stars of heaven. The canker worm spoileth and flieth away. This system of ancient Assyria, this Nineveh city, had the same substance as modern day Babylon. It had the same system. The churches were affiliated to them. They were subject to them. They wore the Phrygian caps. They were free on condition of subservience. And the merchants were raised up above the stars of heaven, above the very powers of heaven. And they were linked to the Assyrian king. They could not trade without his permission. In the same way, we go to our time, the Council for Inclusive Capitalism with the Vatican, a new alliance of global business leaders launches today. Exactly what happened in the case of Assyria is happening in the world today. New York, the Council for Inclusive Capitalism with the Vatican, a historic new partnership between some of the world's largest investment and business leaders and the Vatican was launched today. Under whose moral guidance? Under the moral guidance of His Holiness Pope Francis and His Eminence Cardinal Peter Turkson, who leads the dicastery for promoting integral human development at the Vatican. And inspired by the moral imperative of all faiths, the Council invites companies of all sizes to harness the potential of the private sector to build a fairer, more inclusive and sustainable economic foundation for the world. You may only be economically active if you serve the system. The small man will be removed from his power in the economic world. The middle class will be eradicated. Only these papal knights with their mega corporations, these knights of Malta who not only control industry but control the pharmacological world and all the drugs that are given in the world and the medical world and any system that runs with that stream will be polluted by that stream. God's people have been given a health message for the time in which we are living. And the system of the world with its pharmacia is directly opposed to the very simple health message that God has given his people for the time in which we are living in. And these papal knights, these knights of Malta, these Rothschilds who control the medical world and the pharmacological industries of the world, they are actors and knights under the direct leadership of the papacy. Pope Francis joins with CEOs of Fortune 500 companies to form a new council focused on creating a more equitable economy, a so-called better capitalism. 
So you have the CEOs of Visa Bank of America, which is, of course, Jesuit-owned. Salesforce and other Fortune 500 companies have joined the Council for Inclusive Capitalism with the Vatican. We don't have to go into the details. But are the situations that we are describing similar to what happened in Assyria? Absolutely. Now they are calling for a one-world government. And the world in 2020 has seen an upheaval as it has never experienced in my lifetime before. Here's an extract from His Royal Highness Prince Bernard of the Netherlands, who was the founder of the Bilderberg Movement, which gathers the elite of the world into a think tank for a new world order. And here is an extract from his biography, and it reads, At a small hotel near Arnhem in the deeply wooded uplands of Eastern Holland, on May 29, 30 and 31, 1954, a group of eminent statesmen, financiers and intellectuals from the principal nations of Europe and the United States met together in perhaps the most unusual international conference ever held until then. And the Bilderbergers, getting their name from the hotel, were formed at that stage. But who really was behind the Bilderbergers? None other than Joseph Heronim Rettinger, who was, of course, a Jesuit. Here he is seen hobnobbing with the political elites of the world, with the Rothschilds, with Prince Bernard of the Netherlands, with the Vatican, bringing the Jesuitical idea of subservience to Rome by the entire world to fruition. And the Pope that he used was the papal knight, Pope Paul VI, and he was the first to write an encyclical that called on the nations to abandon their sovereignty to form a world government. Here came the call for a new world order, a great reset, if you wish, which has gained new momentum in the year 2020 under the COVID pandemic. And we cannot let this pandemic go to waste. It must be used to introduce this new world order. So Rettinger, who formed and created, according to the biography of Prince Bernard himself, who formed the Bilderberg Group in order to create this international new world order think tank for and subservient to the Vatican. The next pope to call for a new world order was Pope Benedict the 16th in December 25, 2005 in his Christmas speech. He urged humanity to unite against terrorism, poverty and the environmental blight and called for a new world order to correct economic imbalances. This is now taking shape under Pope Francis. So we can expect that he would call for this new world order as well. Absolutely. Christianity Daily. Pope Francis calls for a new world order for post-pandemic world. The Pope called for a new world order to arise after the COVID pandemic, similar to what globalists behind the Great Reset are working towards. Are we in a point of history where every single situation, as we found it in ancient Assyria in Nineveh, is being reenacted in the world today? Are we living in a point of time in the history of this world when God's retributive action is going to take place? Here is modern diplomacy. They say Joe Biden is a restorer of the new world order. And after the chaos that we experienced in the last few years, the Daily Cardinal writes, Trump abandoned the new world order. Biden will rejoin it. America must regain its place on the world stage because we are the only country capable of leading the new world order. We are the only nation with the sheer size, the population, the industrial capacity, the military might and the strategic geographic location 
to stand up to the bullies and autocrats of this world and to really address the issues that we as a species need to reckon with. Make no mistake, the world is ready to give their power unto the beast. And when the United States rules the world, the Catholic Church will rule the world, said Cardinal Quigley. And here we can see a fulfillment of prophecy. The wound has been healed. And we are on the very point of the final act in the drama of the great controversy. Nahum chapter 3 ends with these verses. Thy crowned are as the locusts, and thy captains as the great grasshoppers, with camp in the hedges in the cold day, but when the sun arises they flee away, and their places is not known where they are. Thy shepherds slumber. Can we see the military aspect together with the religious aspect? Make no mistake. Rome is a military organization. The black pope, the head of the Jesuit order, is a general. The knights of Malta, they are a military order. This is a military organization. But it is also a religious organization. And what will happen to their shepherds? Thy shepherds slumber, O king of Assyria. Thy nobles shall dwell in the dust. Thy people is scattered upon the mountains, and no man gathereth them. There is no healing of thy bruise. Thy wound is grievous. All that hear of the brute of thee shall clap their hands over thee, for upon whom has not thy wickedness passed continually? Exactly what happened there will happen today. They will sleep in the dust. God will destroy them. They will lie in state, says the Bible. They will be banned to the grave. Similar echoes we hear in Jeremiah 51 verse 9 where he says, We would have healed Babylon, but she is not healed. Forsake her and let her go, every one into his own country, for her judgment reaches unto heaven and is lifted up upon the skies. May God give us mercy and may he enlighten the minds of many so that they can see the danger in which they are, flee from Babylon, escape from her plagues and join the army of the Lord under the bloodstained banner of Prince Emmanuel. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, the world is at a point of decision and the final retributive act of heaven is about to take place the news tells us where we are in the stream of time give your people wisdom and may many escape and flee from this babylonian stronghold is my prayer in jesus name amen